Thank you, and welcome to our webinar. I'm Jane Hesley, and I'm an Imaging Application Scientist at Molecular Devices. In this webinar, I'll give a quick overview of high-throughput, high-content imaging, and then we will hear from Yas Yor, the Managing Director of Mimetus. Yas will illustrate how they scaled up their assays using three-dimensional models and the ImageExpress microsystems. First, in case you're not completely familiar with high-throughput imaging, I'll spend a couple of minutes giving an overview of the workflow and the potential applications. Traditionally, biologists would treat some cells with drugs or growth factors, put them on a microscope slide after staining them or in some way marking their response with fluorescent proteins, or they may even be looking at morphological changes with transmitted light. Instead of just inspecting cells through an eyepiece, we take pictures, images, to study and get a sense for whether or not the cells reacted to the drug. Even if the acquisition with a conventional microscope is automated, then what do you do with the images? You need to piece together the image analysis separate from your acquired plate files and devise a way to keep the results associated with the original images. The hands-on time can be multiple hours and it takes experience and skill to run a successful experiment. By using an automated high-content imaging system, experiments can be just as easily run on anything from microscope slides to 1536 well plates with no compromise in image quality. This includes the ability to image specialty plates, such as the organoplate from Mimitas for generating 3D structures. The ImageExpress microsystem can be set up in a few minutes and the biologist can walk away while images are acquired and analysis using the integrated software can occur in parallel with acquisition. Once numbers are generated for the parameters of interest, responsive cells or wells can be identified, statistically analyzed, plotted, and conclusions drawn. Since all images and measurements are stored together in a database, the burden of keeping the data organized is removed from the scientist and the results can be shared within a networked company or organization. The hands-on time is dramatically shortened due to the automated and seamless integration of acquisition, analysis, and viewing of results. Mimetis is going to present how they transitioned a 3D organ-on-a-chip assay from an automated standalone microscope to a true high-throughput system using their organoplate platform. There are hundreds of applications that can be done with automated imaging. Obviously, these slides list just a subset of them. In these images, you see examples of co-cultured liver cells and fibroblasts, a high magnification image which can be used to characterize subcellular structures, and an angiogenesis assay in a gel matrix. This slide shows more examples, including sample images of neuroid outgrowths, a 3D spheroid, and a transgenic zebrafish. We have a great track record for solving your biological questions with an automated workflow. The complete solution for automated imaging begins with reliably acquiring in-focus images of every site and with the ability to collect images over a wide z-plane if using a 3D sample. Then you will identify objects using algorithms that are designed for your specific assay type. You will receive multiple measured parameters from the image analysis that you can then use to draw your conclusions. You can use the data analysis application we offer to pull the numbers out of the database for generation of EC50 curves or IC50 curves, or to use it with hit finding methods. Molecular Devices provides an end-to-end -end workflow, including each of the previously mentioned steps, starting with the image acquisition using one of our Image Express systems shown here at the top. Image analysis is carried out using the Meta Express or Meta Express PowerCore software. In the center of it all, we have the data management solution. This is our MDC store database. MetaExpress automatically communicates with that management solution to store images and present them back to you for visualization and analysis. MDC store also links the results of your analysis to the acquired plates. The data mining software, Acuity Express, communicates with the database and allows processing of the results. It also allows you to compare or combine results from multiple plates across a screen. There are choices for your automated imager. The Image Express Micro 4 is our newest wide field system that is field upgradable to a confocal system if your needs change. The Image Express confocal system is ideal for any assay that may have high background and particularly for many of the 3D assays. Either of these instruments will allow you to acquire Z stacks and utilize our software's 3D analysis capabilities, however. Meta Express software is key to high content imaging. The software not only runs the instrumentation, but provides different levels of analysis tools, proceeding from simple on the left to extremely flexible on the right. Our turnkey solution allows a scientist to easily evaluate images 
using one of the numerous available application modules such as multi-wavelength cell scoring, cell cycle, or neurite outgrowth. Custom modules allow a user to build a personalized analysis using standard and custom algorithms to generate specific data such as volumes and distances within 3D spaces. All the modules can be saved and shared between users. Journal macros allow power users the ultimate control to perform sophisticated procedures, including hardware control. To reiterate, with the correct system, there's no barrier to scaling up even 3D assays. Images can be seamlessly acquired in multi-well plates, visualized and analyzed with integrated software, and then decisions can be made based on the output you choose. And this can be done with either wide field or confocal images. Now I would like to turn it over to Yas so that he may present on human tissue models for better therapies. Please don't forget you may submit questions at any time for us to answer when the presentations are complete. Thank you. Thank you, Jane, for the kind introduction. It's a great pleasure for me to present today our company, Memeras, our core product, the organoplate, and our exciting organ on a chip, tissue and disease models, together with molecular devices. First, I'm going to give you an overview of this webinar. I'm going to introduce to you Memetis. I'm going to spend a few words on why we actually need phenotypic models. Then, I'm going to make you acquainted with the organoplate, which is our core product and the carrier of all of our models. I'm going to show you a couple of examples on models that we develop in organoplates, such as models made up with cells which grow inside an extracellular matrix. Then we'll move on to our unique perfuse tubule models, where a tubule of epithelial or endothelial cells grows against an extracellular matrix, and the perfusion flow of the medium goes through the lumen of the tubules. When we combine those models, we get co-cultures, either of two adjacent tubules or a tubule next to cells that grow inside an extracellular matrix, in order to create higher level complex tissue models. Then I'm going to show you some of the assays that we developed in the organoplate that allow you to in get interrogate the models that grow inside the plate. And I'm going to finish up with a summary of this webinar. After the webinar, there will be ample opportunity to ask any questions. Our mission is to provide human tissue and organ models for 21st century therapeutics. We want to help to create better medicines and personalized therapies. But of course, physiologically relevant tissue models are also crucial for improving our fundamental insight in tissue function and disease. The headquarters of Memetis is based in Leiden, in the Netherlands. In the east of the Netherlands, in Enschede, we have a manufacturing site where we produce our organoplates. We have a subsidiary in Rockville, Maryland, in the USA, we have an agent in Tokyo in Japan. Our model development customers are based all over the world. So this is where we come from. 2D cell culture has been around for over a century now and it has learned us a lot about cellular physiology. Animal testing is applied a lot in drug development. Unfortunately both technologies are not very predictive towards people. They don't predict whether a drug is going to work in humans. So we need something else. Ideally we want to do the experiments on people, but there's obviously limitations to that. So what we need is a model which is in the middle, that encompasses 3D cell culture, that uses human cells and tissues, that are co-cultured, allowing the cells to interact and to create organ and tissue functions. These 3D models should be perfused, for example with an artificial blood flow. They should contain tubes and vessels, and the cells should be embedded in an extracellular matrix, mimicking the physiological environment of cells in normal human tissues. The thing is that we need models which are complex enough in order to allow us to do the measurements that we want, but not too complex, which would prevent us from doing any useful experiments. As Einstein said, you gotta make things as simple as possible, but not any simpler. 
So that's why we developed the organoplate. The organoplate is based on a standard 384 well plate. It can contain up to 96 individual microfluidic networks. And because the plate is fully compatible with high content readers, pipetting equipment, and other plate reading equipment, it can serve any throughput from tens of assays up to hundreds or thousands or even hundred thousands of assays. So this is what the microfluidics look like inside an organoplate. Here you see a red fluid, which is the extracellular matrix, which is liquefied, is entered into the device. And as you see, the fluid only fills part of the microfluidic network. That is because there's a ridge between the two channels, which is called a phase guide. It's a meniscus pinning barrier. Here on the right you see the fluid coming in in a cross section from the right, and a meniscus will tend to align itself along this meniscus pinning barrier or phase guide. It will not jump over unless you pressurize it. Once the gel is set, we have a gel filled channel here at the bottom, and the top channel can be perfused with medium. The phase guide technology allows us in a fully passive manner to control liquids. It allows us to pattern gels inside the organoplate. We can create gradients and we can layer multiple lanes in adjacent co-culture setups next to each other in order to create higher tissue functionalities. The organoplate, because it's a standard plate, it's easy to use and compatible. It serves any throughput. There's no pumps needed to drive the plate and no tubing, which makes handling actually very easy. easy. The imaging is high quality because the bottom plate is microscope quality glass, which allows very high quality imaging using high content readers or standard microscopes and even high end confocal laser scanning micro microscopes. And finally, because it's microfluidics, reagent consumption is low. For example, media, growth factors, but also extracellular matrix gels are only needed in small quantities. So here's a single device inside an organoplate. It takes up four wells of a 384 well plate. The first well serves as a gel inlet. You can enter the liquefied gel into the device through this well. The second well serves as a medium inlet. Once you put medium in there, it will start to flow alongside the cells in the gel, right here, towards the medium outlet. Actually, this movie shows in a lot more detail how it works. So here's the organoplate. When you tip it over, you see the microfluidics in the reflection. Up to 96 individual microfluidic networks with a gel inlet, perfusion channel and the phase guide. Here we enter the liquefied gel into the device. The gel goes into the device by capillary force and the phase guide, which is right here in the middle, prevents the gel from jumping over to the adjacent channel. Once the gel is set, a virtual channel is created that can be perfused with medium. Here the medium is entered into the device. The medium here in blue will start to flow alongside the cells in the gel. Remember there's no physical barriers between the medium and the gel channel, allowing complete interaction of nutrients, growth factors, pharmaceutical compounds between the medium and the cells. In this way we can keep cells alive for weeks or months, if you like. Cells may cluster together, such as hepat hepatocytes, and at any point in time you can take out the plate and imaging use, image it using a high content reader or a moving stage microscope or a standard microscope. You get up to 96 individual data points from a single organoplate. Just a few words on perfusion. To achieve pump and tube free perfusion, we use a rocker platform, the perfusion rocker. The fluid flow through the tissues growing in organoplates is driven by gravity leveling. 
To make it go continuously, the plates are simply placed on the perfusion rocker inside an incubator. The perfusion rocker features timed programs designed for the organoplate. Of course, for evaluation purposes, you can use a standard continuous rocker platform. If you want to have full control over the perfusion in organoplates, you can use a perfusion rocker. Here's a quick overview of some of the models that we work on and that can be developed inside an organoplate. Our brain models primarily use iPSC-derived neurons with astrocytes and other accessory cells. These are endothelial models or vasculature where we create endothelial tubules which are perfused. The vasculature models can be combined with a range of other models. These are kidney tubules, primarily proximal tubules of the kidney, which serve as a great model, for example, for kidney toxicity. Our cancer models, where we work on pancreatic cancer, glioblastoma, and breast cancer, liver models based on primary hepatocytes, iPSC derived hepatocytes, as well as a range of well characterized hepatocyte cell lines. And finally, our gut models, which are based on, for example, KCO2s, but also on small intestinal gut organoids and other sources of cells. So some tissue configurations in the organoplate. In a two-lane organoplate, we have two lanes available, where one of the lanes can be used as a perfusion channel with a flow of medium, and the other lane can contain an extracellular matrix gel in which the cells grow or we can put down an empty extracellular matrix gel and seed the cells as a tubule against the gel where the perfusion flow actually goes through the tubule. We can combine those into a tubule in combination with cells growing inside the gel. In the three-lane organoplate, which is currently not available as an off-the-shelf product but which will become available later this year, there's three lanes available. So there we can have a flow lane with two different cell types growing inside two different gels. We can have the cells in the gel in the middle lane with perfusion of different media on both sides creating a gradient across the tissue. Or we can for example have two tubules on both sides of a gel in which the cells grow. So all of the imaging I'm going to show you has been done inside the plate. We either use confocals or plate readers or if we want throughput and convenience we use the molecular devices ImageExpress Micro and ImageExpress Micro Confocal which work very well with the organoplate. First a few examples of our models. This is an example of cells that grow inside an extracellular matrix gel. These are induced pluripotent stem cell derived 3D neuronal networks. You're looking at a scan through the confocal stacks in an organoplate. The typical length of a channel is about 3 millimeters. The height of a channel is 120 microns. So you immediately see here that there's a real three-dimensional neuronal network present in these plates. Network formation takes place in about 24 hours. When the cells are seeded, they're rounded off, but already in a couple of hours they start to generate um, projections and there's a fully functional neuronal network after 24 hours when you seed mature, differentiated iPSC-derived neurons. So here's a full lane containing neurons in a two-lane plate. We can do a range of marker stains on cells which are fixed inside the plate. Antibodies are added inside the plate and washed out and subsequently the models are uh, photographed during fluorescence micro microscopy. We can also look at neuronal activity inside these models. So here we use a calcium sensitive dye in order to show the spontaneous activity of these neurons in the organoplate. 
you can see the flickering here which is firing neurons inside the neuronal network in this case as I said spontaneous activity we can either use neuronal uh, neuroprogenitor cells or we can see mature neurons in these plates for neuroprogenitors it takes anything between six to eight weeks in order to differentiate into fully mature neurons we use a range of different sources for these cells for example from cellular dynamics, exogenesis, exol and AMS bio and we can see glutamatergic, GABAergic or dopaminergic neurons and we often co-culture them with astrocytes and other accessory cells the neural activity can be quantified inside these plates using already developed pre-set up procedures in order to identify the firing cells inside the plate so this allows us to also modulate their activity for example if we have GABA sensitive cells and we add GABA we see that the spontaneous activity decreases whereas when we add just medium nothing changes these models are perfect for example for neurotoxicity assessment so here we add a concentration series of methylmercury to the cells that have formed a uh, neuronal network and there you see that upon increasing concentration of methylmercury the neurite extension dramatically goes down this can be quantified using automated procedures and there you get a nice graph of dose response versus the concentration of methylmercury or we can look at cell viability here with three canonical neurotoxicants uh, such as 2,5-hexindione, endosulfan and methylmercury and we measure viability, cell viability using standard off-the-shelf kits now some examples of perfused tubules inside organoplates first how do we make a tubule in an organoplate? Well, first we put down an empty extracellular matrix gel and allow it to set then we enter the cells inside the medium into the adjacent channel and we allow the cells to sediment on top of the gel you can do this by putting the plate on its side or we can actually have the cell sediment to the bottom and they will grow out as well depending on the cell type when the cells have attached to the gel they will start to grow and form a continuous layer along the circumference of the channel the perfusion flow of the medium goes through the lumen of the tubules here's an example of such a tubule here's the gel and there's the tubule in this case it's MDCKs it's a dog kidney tubule cell line and here it's obvious that the boundary between the gel and the cells is nothing but, but extracellular matrix gel so there's no physical barriers between the tubule and the gel which allows you to do transport experiments uh, toxicity and leakage experiments but also later on to add cells in the gel and allow these cells to interact directly with the epithelial tubule on the left so this is what these cells look like when stained with a variety of markers here we use acetylated tubulin in red to stain the cilia and as you see the cilia are only on the inside of the tubule and not on the outside which is also the case for ZO1 ZO1 is a stain for tight junctions and as you see ZO1 in green is also here only on the apical side of the cells and not on the basal side here's a blow up which nicely shows the cilia in red here and the ZO1 primarily at the apical side of the cells so these cells are fully polarized which means that transport going through the cells is also directional once we have a tubule we can measure its leak tightness inside the organoplate using a real-time barrier integrity assay we do this by entering a fluorescent dye into the tubule this dye can be conjugated to for example 
dextrin of any size, allow you to dis discriminate between large molecule leakage and small molecule leakage. When the tubule is leak tight, the dye will stay within the tubule. When it's leaky, the dye will start to migrate into the adjacent gel through diffusion. And by quantifying the intensity of fluorescence inside the tubule channel and the adjacent channel, and take the ratio of that, you get a dynamic measurement of the leakiness or the barrier integrity of a tubule growing inside an organoplate. This is a fully unique assay because it's time dependent, it's dynamic, and you can revisit it man many times. And because it's in an organoplate, it allows you to do multiple measures, measurements at the same time. So here we have the same MDCK, so the dog uh, kidney more or less distal tubule cell line exposed to a concentration series of storosporin, which is um, fairly well known for inducing leakiness in kidney tubules. It's toxic to these kidney tubules. And you see that with increasing concentration of storosporin from left to right, the tubules start to leak first. You see on the right they start leaking first and on the left it takes more time. We can quantify this in many ways and here you see the leakage score over time actually showing that at low concentrations the tubes start to leak more slowly and at high concentrations the leaking starts earlier. We can also depict that as the concentration of torosporin over the leakage score or we can calculate an, IC50, an EC50 curve. And finally, um, which we also find often very useful, is to create a sort of Kaplan-Meier curve of these, curve, of these tubes, which means that we score the survival of the leak tight tubules, which also gives a very nice insight in the effects of the compounds at different concentrations. Tubular models are also possible with a got on a chip. So in this case uh, we see uh, a phase contrast image of a KCO2 tubule, which is a human colon adenocarcinoma cell line. These cells form very nice leak tight tubules inside organoplates. And we can use these models to assess uh, effects of compounds, uh, growth factors or uh, inflammatory factors on the leak tightness of these tubules. These are endothelial tubules. So here you see a tubule which grows against an extracellular matrix gel, which is here on the left. It doesn't light up because it's not fluorescent. And here's a tubule of 200 microns wide, 120 microns in height, and a couple of millimeters long of UVEX, or so human umbilical vein endothelial cells. On the right you see that upon staining with CD31, there's nice expression of CD31 around the circumference of the cells and also V cadherin, VE cadherin is, is nicely expressed in these cells. And also here throughput applies. So this is an experiment where we use a range of different culture conditions, medium compositions, in order to assess their effect on the leak tightness of these endothelial tubules. So the tubules are grown against a range of different ECMs, seeded with a range of different seeding densities and with different medium compositions. And here you see, for example, in the white box, there's a lot of leakage going on, but in the red and the blue box, the tubules are fully leak tight. This can be quantified and can be used to optimize the models and later on to use these models as a readout for effects on vascular leakage. When we have an endothelial tubule, in this case in a three-lane organoplate, so there's a perfusion lane at the top, a perfusion lane at the bottom, and there's a gel lane in the middle. We grew an endothelial vessel right here in the top lane, and then we added uh, angiogenic factors, a mix of angiogenic factors to the bottom lane. What happens then is that the cells start to sprout towards the high concentration of angiogenic factors. 
First they start to sprout, you get fusion of capillaries and lumen formation, and finally the lumen is widened. The end result is a vascular bed which grows through the extracellular matrix gel, here in the middle, towards the adjacent channel which is perfused. When we stain this with VE coherin and actin, it looks like this. I think a very beautiful image with the large vessel right here and microcapillaries with a typical diameter of 10 to 20 microns growing through the extracellular matrix gel towards the other end of the channel. And here we scan through the confocal stack layers just to show that this is a real three-dimensional culture. So to show that these microcapillaries are actually perfused, we have entered a fluorescent dye into the blood vessel channel, which is the top channel here. And here you see that the dye flows through the microcapillaries and enters the channel at the bottom, which is the medium channel. There we go. So these microcapillaries are actually connecting the blood vessel channel to the medium channel at the bottom. So when we combine different models we get co-cultures and this is exactly what we want because we want these co-cultures uh, we want cells to interact and to create higher tissue functionality. So the first example is these blood vessel models. So let me see. This is a tubule of parasites in the outer tubule and uvec endothelial cells in the inner tubule. So it's a tube in a tube setup. Here in the cross section you see in green the parasites and the, the endothelial cells in red right here in, in the center of the green tubule. This is the exact setup of a normal blood vessel which allows studies towards the interaction between the parasites and the endothelial cells. At the bottom, we have entered vital dye stained primary monocytes into a uvec tubule. And you see they nicely show up here, and we can use these models to um, assay for monocyte attachment and also monocyte transmigration through the blood vessel wall into the adjacent compartment of the organoplate. This is a co-culture model of two tubules. On the one side we have a blood vessel made of endothelial cells and on the other side we have a kidney proximal tubule here made up of RPTEC cells which are developed by Sigma Aldrich so this is a proximal tubule cell line. Right here in the middle is the extracellular matrix gel which is in this case empty. Here there's a variety of stains in order to characterize these cells. The proximal tubule is stained with ezrin. The blood vessel is stained with RFP by stable introduction of RFP expression into the endothelial cells. This is a combination of a blood vessel, astrocytes and neurons. The blood vessel has been established in the top channel which is perfused. In the middle is an extracellular matrix gel and in the bottom neurons and astrocytes were co-seeded inside a gel in the bottom channel. What happens is that the astrocytes start to move through the gel towards the blood vessel, which is actually shown here. The astrocytes are stained with CD44, the neurons are stained with MAP2 and the UVAX again with stably uh, transfected RFP. So the astrocytes have migrated into the gel in the middle and start to move in the direction of the endothelial cells. Obviously this is a big step towards the development of a neurovascular unit or a blood-brain barrier model. So now after these co-culture models I would like to show you some of the assays that we have developed inside organoplates. First the imaging readouts. Here, at the top left, we see 
face contrast imaging, which is fairly obvious, but it can be done in time lapse over prolonged periods of time inside an automated microscope or inside a high content reader like uh, the molecular devices image express machines. On the right, fluorescent microscopy, which can also be done automated inside the plate, confocal microscopy, and we have a range of different applications developed where we do automated 3D image analysis, for example for the leakage assays as well as for the neuronal activity assays. Some of the assays are neurotoxicity assays, like the neuride extension assay, and cell viability assays, which can also be applied to a range of other cell types, of course. Neuronal activity assays, which I showed you. This is a uh, calcium, uh, calcium release assay using calcium sensitive dyes, which is basically quantified in an automated manner. Our unique epithelial barrier integrity assays, where we enter a fluorescent dye into a preformed tubule and measure the leakiness of the tubule by assessing the uh, migration of the dye into the adjacent channel. And finally, I didn't show you any examples of that, our angiogenesis assays, where we can actually quantify or measure the length of the extension of uh, microcapillaries in response to angiogenic factors or anti-angiogenic factors. So some of the assay modalities. I showed you some fluorescent imaging, but we can also use fluorescence to quantify uh, a range of reagents inside the organoplate, such as an albumin blue assay. We can use luminescence, for example in the standard real-time glow assay to assess cell viability. We do transepithelial electrical resistance measurements, specifically in the blood-brain bar barrier models, where we do electrical measurements in order to assess the barrier function of uh, epithelial or endothelial layers in great detail. And finally, there's a range of uh, molecular assays developed inside the organoplate, basically by lysing the cells in the plate and taking out the lysates, allowing us to do qPCR sequencing and other types of molecular assays. So we're almost at the end and summarizing the Mamedas Organoplate is we think the platform of choice to create physiologically relevant tissues. It's easy to use, it supports pump-free flow, membrane-free co-culture and high-quality automated imaging. So here's a quick comparison between some of the technologies that are available to create tissue models. So there's in the organ or chip world PDMS which is a silicon rubber based device. Well these devices support for example tubules but they always require pumps and tubes in order to, 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 uh, to be operated. Their throughput is limited. There's always a membrane between the cells preventing the cells from real physical interaction. Their format is not compatible. It's not a microplate or anything compatible with existing equipment. Imaging is often difficult and, which is very important for pharmaceutical applications, PDMS is very well known for absorbing hydrophobic compounds, so it's generally incompatible with pharmaceutical compounds. And finally, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to produce these PDMS devices uh, in large quantities. Officially not organ on a chip, but 3D tissues can also be printed. It's very difficult to perfuse these because it's difficult to connect a, a printed tissue to a tube or a pump, but you would need tubes and pumps if you could. Hollow structures such as tubes and vessels are difficult. The throughput is fairly limited. It is membrane free because you can print cell types on top of each other and allow them to interact. The format is generally not compatible. Uh, imaging is difficult. It often requires sectioning of the tissues. Materials are compatible and mask production is currently not available. Hanging drops are a very useful tool but they have a limited number of applications. So perfusion is very difficult if not impossible in hanging drops. Tubes and vessels are not possible. The throughput 
because most of these plates are actually based on a 96 well plate. The throughput is fairly high. Uh, coal culture can, om can only be a mixed coal culture, so there's no structured layered coal culture such as in the organo plate. The format is compatible. Imaging is often difficult because the tissue can be at, at different heights in the, in the channel um, or in the device, which makes it difficult to focus and to find the tissue uh, inside these devices. Materials are compatible and mass production is available. And finally, just as a comparison, it's, it's not real 3D cell culture, but we see it a lot, uh, membrane inserts which are used to culture uh, monolayers of cells on both sides of the membrane. So there's no perfusion there, no tubes and vessels. The throughput can be fairly high because there's 96 well uh, versions of those plates available. Obviously there's always a membrane between the cells which prevents them from real physical interaction. Format is compatible. Imaging is difficult. Um, basically you have to take out the membrane and section it to have a good look at the cross-section of the cells growing on the membrane. Materials are compatible and there's mass production. We think that the organo plate as an organo chip device ticks all the boxes to create physiologically relevant models um, in 3D with perfusion and co-culture easily, easy to handle with great imaging. So just an overview of our models of cells growing inside the gel with a perfusion channel adjacent to the cells. We develop liver models based on primary hepatocytes, iPSC derived hepatocytes, as well as um, hepatocyte cell lines. I showed you our neuronal models towards brain models where we can create three-dimensional neuronal networks inside the plate. We work a lot with uh, organoids which are LGR5 plus uh, organoids such as small intestinal organoids but other, also other types of organoids are perfused tubular models where the tubule is seeded against a preset exocellular matrix gel in the adjacent channel such as the kidney proximal tubule models the vasculature models and the thelial tubules as well as the gut models and we combine those into co-culture models where we have two tubules in our kidney clearance model so there's a proximal tubule as well as a blood vessel a co-culture of astrocytes and neurons with an endothelial tubule and this is the example of a tube in a tube setup I showed you with endothelium um, in the center of a parasite tubule at the manners we're convinced that these organoplate based models are the next generation of phenotypic models they can capture the complexity of tissues by having adjacent co-culture of different cell types, incorporating vessel structures which are perfused, allowing full interaction between the cells and a free choice of extracellular matrices. We can capture disease phenotypes in these models by taking primary patient-derived cells or IPSC-derived cells from a variety of genetic backgrounds. We can enter reagents, challenges into the models in order to recreate disease phenotypes and use many other methods. And obviously we can enter pharmaca into these models to assess their effects. And finally by using either iPSC derived cells, stem cells, organoid cells or primary cells we can capture the differences between individuals. We started off applying these models primarily in the preclinical field, looking into tox, transport and other types of assays. But over the last two years we've been moving towards primary and secondary screens by developing disease models and specific models which are set up for screening of compound effects. Hypermanus, we're also working on personalized medicine applications where we enter patient-derived cells and tissues into these devices in order to assess the effects of pharmaceutical compounds before we actually administer a drug to a patient. 
So this is a list of some of the publications on organoplate-based models. You can have a look at them in your own time, or you can visit uh, memetas.com, uh, where they're also listed. Finally, I would like to thank you for your attention and for your time. And I would also like to thank Molecular Devices again for collaborating on this great webinar. And of course, I would like to thank the Memetis team of about 42 biologists, engineers, and supporting colleagues that were all crucial to develop these exciting new technologies and models.